but um, and somebody just told me that I'm Tim Wessel, so uh, I, I'm good for the next 10 minutes anyway. But we've got uh, we've got some great stuff happening tonight. First of all, uh, tonight uh, first of all we have Dr. Dr. Karen is back to do our Q and A, which is always good to have his knowledge, and he's uh, going to be doing that the second half of the meeting. And in the first half of the meeting, we have our guest speaker tonight, Galen Beatty. And Galen is from uh, the Backyard Habitat, uh, manages the Backyard Habitat program and part of the Columbia Land Trust. And, um, and she'll be telling you a little more about that when I finish the meeting intro and all this other discussion. Um, I also, first of all, I'd like to welcome our new communicator. We had two open positions, and one of them was the club communicator, and that has been filled by Michael Carlson. And Michael, are you around? Oh, he's over here. Communicator. Um, we still have another position open. If uh, anyone is interested, it's the member at large position, and there is uh, information about that. And I think you can find on one of the back tables there'll be a sort of a job flyer for that. It's an interesting uh, job. Um, we also have uh, Mark Wenzel is uh, is not an officer, but he actually uh, did. Uh, does, he always does the real tasty snacks and everything. And Mark, are you back there? I see him in the back of the room. He did some, uh, had worked on his own to take some photographs of uh, photos that we've all gotten from, uh, you know, different members of the club and made postcards and little pads and other things. The sales of those, and I encourage you if, if you can, because 100% of the proceeds from the sales of those will go to the Honey Bee Lab down at OSU. And as I don't know if you know or not, but they, the head of that lab, uh, Dr. Ramesh Sagili, is spending most of his time instead of doing science, he's writing grants. And, and any of you that have worked in the university or college situation, you know, it's like we'd, we'd rather he be working on the research. So anything we can do to help them out financially would be appreciated. So that's pretty neat. Those cards are in the back of the room. and. Relatively inexpensive, and it's a great way to contribute to the B Lab. Um, so, um, let me see. We also have, and at the intermission, Rosanna Mattingly. It's, Rosanna is a uh, local author and writer and uh, author of uh, How the Honey Bee Worker Does What She Does, or The Honey Maker. It's a new book, and I actually got that last fall with Don at the uh, Beekeeping Conference in Seaside. And it's a wonderful book. So that'll be, and she'll be signing uh, copies of that book in the back of the room uh, anytime and during the intermission, especially. Uh, I need a, a couple of reports. Uh, Frank, would you want to do a treasury report and maybe an update on the Beaver Creek uh, bees and fleas? Yeah, I certainly do. So I'm Frank and uh, our, our treasurer. And uh, a couple of things. One is that the up fiscal year is. Uh, June to the end of May, so we're in the re-up for our memberships uh, to encourage people to do it promptly so we don't drag this out. We have a one-week special of $2 off for um, renewing memberships, not for new memberships, but the membership fee is $15 for individuals, $25 for a family, so for the next week it's $13.23. It's a good time to, uh, to start out again and, and uh, complete your membership for this year. Uh, just going past it, because I'm not sure if, if uh, Tim actually wanted a treasurer's report, but our current bank account is very within a dollar to a thousand dollars. So uh, we, all of it is from dues from last year, and uh, we really appreciate it. On July 13th, uh, <clears throat> Hub is going to be one of the major exhibitors at the B portion of the Beaver Creek B and Flea Festival. And what this is, is that the hamlet of Beaver Creek, in which I live, and I'm co-chair from that end, is about 10 miles south of Oregon City. So it's really a pretty location, and every year they have an annual craft fair and flea market, but uh, to try and give it a different flavor, we're trying to make about 25% of it bee related, so um, I'm in the process of, of contacting vendors uh, and other bee related people to also be uh, participating.
participants and exhibitors, and Pub is going to have a table there. And uh, I'd certainly like any help uh, in manning the table uh, and ideas of what we want to put up, just anything connected with it. So right now we've got about 45 days. And uh, um, please come and see me about that. It'll be a really nice day in the country on July 13th. Thanks, okay. Great. Thanks a lot, Frank. Um, uh, we've got, uh, just want to remind everyone that uh, the name tags will be here on shortly, probably sometime in the next 20 minutes. Mike is actually, believe it or not, out catching a swarm, and he's been really wanting another swarm to populate one of his extra hives, and nobody's telling him where they are, and he's always at work when they come in. Of course, Brian has taken most of the swarms that are out there, Brian. Thank you very much. <laughs> I've been passing um, those to uh, Molly and... Yes, yep, us too. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, it, we're spread, it spreads around. So, um, so he'll be here shortly with the name tags, and then, again, we'll all know who we are, and, and uh, we can use those name tags to do the raffle, which Melissa informs me is going to be a grab bag tonight. It's going to be fun. We're not sure what it is. Yeah, one of the things I think we're going to have is a, uh, a really nice uh, handbag with a picture of a couple of bees um, all over a flower on it. It's beautifully uh, printed from one of the photographs. It's actually a photo that I took. I don't know how it got on that bag, but um, pretty. Yeah, it's pretty weird. I better call them. Last year, I don't know. Probably some brownies you ate. Yeah, probably. That's probably true. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, can we do? Is Stephanie here? Are you going to do the finger pup report? Yes. So Stephanie is uh, our other leader and she is away, so I will go ahead and give you a quick update. Uh, we have eight hives populated and yes, thanks to a lot of you. And we have a core committee that has been meeting to do administrative things, but we have work parties finally rolling. Typically what they're, uh, they're falling on the second Saturday around 11 o'clock and then um, another day sometime in the month. So those work parties are open to anybody who would like hands-on beekeeping experience. And I will be uh, at that table if you want to give me your information. Otherwise, if you are on the Facebook page, then uh, we also put updates and announcements out that way. We also have a list served. And lastly, two completely unrelated. I just wanted to let everybody know if you're not aware that there is a treatment-free beekeeping conference coming up, and uh, it's a wonderful opportunity. It's July 26th, 27th, and 28th. So I'll put this on that back table. Please keep this uh, copy there. Good, great. Thanks, Melissa. Yeah, um, I want to just take a, uh, I, I just introduced you to Michael Carlson, but Michael, would you want to say a few words about the Facebook site, or do you want me to say that, or? Um, Here. Sure. <laughs> I, I always catch him off guard. He's got a computer and everything. Um, I think when one of the significant things that happened this week is we had 300 members on the Facebook site, which is really yeah. amazing. If we could get all 300 people here, we're going to have to get a bigger room. <laughs> um, you know, some people don't use the Facebook page. It seems like a lot of people are gravitating towards that medium for communicating. Lots of information being shared on there. Um, uh, I, I pinned the, the notice about this meeting to the top of the page, and I know sometimes when you go to the to the page and you you see that you think oh there's nothing new. Well, that's pinned to the top, so you have to scroll down to see everything else that's below it. So uh, please go there. We're going to start adding lots more information there. Um, also to the pub uh, uh, website, which is PortlandUrbanBeekeepers.org, we're going to start putting a lot more information there about you know questions that people. Have, uh, like beekeeping 101, what to do each month, things like that. Uh, and if you have questions or things that you want to see, um, you can contact me through the portlandurbanbeekeepers.org website, and all the officers are there. There's a little link. There, our names are in blue and they're underlined, so you can just click on that and it'll send us uh, send me a message. So that. Yeah, I think that's pretty impressive. There's so much information in one day. You go on there and you can see, you know, somebody asks a question, and there'll be within one day there'll be a dozen different people answering it, all pretty much in the same line. But the, the fun thing about it is how 
you know, somebody will say, yes, yeah, true, but you could also do this. And so it's, it's a great way, and it's like, like I was saying to Michael on the way over tonight, is, uh, you know, it, it's not, you don't have to wait for this once a month meeting to get questions answered. And it's, um, and it's a great way to, to get information and to share information, photos, you know, things that are going on. A lot of people will post something, hey, what's this mean? What's this bee doing? You know, why is this? You know, why does my hive look like this? And they post the photos on there, and, and in, within hours, you've got dozens of answers. So it's great. I'm, I'm really excited about the, the 300 member Facebook member site. So with that, without uh, further ado, I left your bio, Galen. But uh, yeah, this is Galen Beatty from the Backyard Habitat Program and the Columbia Land Trust. And she's going to be doing a wonderful presentation tonight about how the plants and pollinators and bees and all work together. Thanks, Kate. So, um, first, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to talk tonight. I heard that Mace Vaughn has spoken recently from Xerxes, and I think those folks at Xerxes are some of the best public speakers around. I've heard them in a number of workshops. And um, to be really honest, I get nervous in large groups. I'm just much more comfortable in someone's backyard, talking to them about landscaping or talking to a group of kids outdoors. So I will do my best tonight, but I think what I, um, what I bring tonight is not any sort of expert knowledge, really. I mean, maids, those guys at Xerxes, other biologists, those are experts. I don't feel like I'm an expert with this. But what I do feel like to talk about is a shared experience that with this backyard habitat program and the background that I have, what we bring, we share this when it comes to our connection with nature. Um, and it's not something outside of the city. It's something that can happen right in our backyard. Um, and so to kind of frame tonight, uh, I'd like to share just a little bit of background about myself because I think that'll tie in nicely. And then just share a few stories of uh, some other backyard habitat participants, and then I'll go into some details about um, what does it mean to be certified. Um, so I'm thinking 30 minutes, um, 10 minutes for questions, hopefully that works. So I confess, I am from Southern California. I think there's many of us up here. Um, I grew up in the 70s and 80s in Los Angeles. I went to high school two blocks from Hollywood Boulevard. Um, I grew up in the city, and that's where I thought I was going to live my entire life. Um, I was blessed to have a great science teacher and experiences that got me outside of Los Angeles, and I got my undergraduate degree in oceanography from Humboldt State, which is very different <laughs> from L.A. Um, and after that, I decided I didn't want to go into research. Um, I really wanted to learn about nature and find in my own experience living in the city and how can we connect with nature, nature and inspire people. Because growing up in the 70s and 80s, it's pretty, it was pretty hard to know all the things that were happening inside our environment, from rivers that were on fire, smog, and my eyes were here and I couldn't like see in the summer, to um, extinction of animals. It's so overwhelming. And so how are we going to get people to care about that? Um, so. Uh, I taught I taught environmental ed for about 20 years, all over the East and West Coast. I've been a park ranger teaching adults about connection with nature and really safe environments. And if we can feel safe about that, then hopefully we'll care about other things. Um, I went back and moved here, and I had my master's in science education. And I started the Backyard Habitat Program in 2006. It was like a really small pilot program in the West Hills. Um, and from there, it's just exploded, and it's becoming this national model for other ways for people to connect with nature in their backyard. So with that, um, I work for Columbia Land Trust, but what I think is really unique about this program is that you have two large nonprofit organizations in our region. So most people are familiar with Columbia and Audubon Society, statewide conservation education program. They have organization, like 15,000 members, they do some amazing work. You may not be familiar with Columbia Land Trust, like Nature Conservancy. Um, land trusts typically go under the radar. We've conserved about 22,000 acres from John Day to Astoria along, along the Columbia watershed. So why have we come together to partner on this program? Because we feel that if people don't understand the value that their backyards can play in conservation, we're 
Why are they going to care that we actually exist? We live right underneath the Pacific Flyway, where millions of birds are flying over our head in the spring or fall. Or why should we conserve land out in the gorge? So we hope by offering this program that those connections are made. So just three stories, not many, but um, if Santa Claus existed, and I'm not saying he doesn't, I would, I would question if Tim Miller could be Santa Claus. I just met him last year. He lives on Northeast 33rd, which is a, a pretty busy street in Portland, and he was on our garden tour. And he, you may not be able to see it, I took this photo in the top left. He goes to the coast and collects driftwood and makes this beautiful, made this beautiful archway in his backyard. And he has a native hedgerow. And he sent me these two photos a couple weeks ago. This is a um, wetland prairie marsh that he has in his backyard. And if you're not familiar with those plants, those are a monkey flower and camas, native plants. And then he um, started a rain garden in his front yard, got rid of the last remnants of grass. Okay, sorry this is a bad photo of iPhone, all I have sometimes. Um, but this is Marie Pierre, and she's a researcher in OHSU, and I met her in 2010 when I was doing a backyard site visit. Um, she, this is her first house, and she wanted to be close to the hospital, and we did her visit even before she moved in. She was so excited about how to landscape her wildlife in her backyard. She lives in the West Hills, and as you can see, ivy growing in the back of the fence. I like having these before photos. Um, but this is after. I did her certification visit last year, so it took her about two years. And Marie Pierre is uh, from southern France. And so she wanted to incorporate a native and ornamental meadow in her backyard. So there's poppies and lavender that remind her of home. But then she has these beautiful native shrubs that bloom to support those pollinators that surround her yard. And she sent me these two photos last fall of, of deer that were using her bird bath. And while well, I can't guarantee you'll have bird, uh, deer in your backyard, um, I just thought it was a perfect example of just sharing that connection that we have and that what we can see. Okay. Trisha and Daryl, they live on the west side. They bought a property that uh, there was a tributary to Tryon Creek that flowed right in their backyard. And they didn't realize what they were about to embark upon. Thick ivy, blackberry, um, clematis, and vinca in their backyard. And it took them years to remove that. And I took this photo when they were on our garden tour three years ago and um, restored this beautiful kind of creekside backyard and they connected with another backyard homeowner and these photos um, where you can see little rock pilings and little photos, um, they landscape for newts and salamanders since there was a creek in their backyard. Um, this, this one they um, added a bat box because they're so close to a water body um, and then they sent me this photo of, of um, success from their landscaping. So thanks for being patient with those three stories. I get these almost every day. Every day from homeowners that are sharing these really intimate experiences that they have with nature. So the program itself, um, you know, our backyards are not complex in the way that a natural area would be, like near Mount Hood. But they are complex in how we use them from you know, wanting to have grass with kids or wanting to grow food and wanting to have natives. So how do we blend that together? Um, and this program is, uh, there's a lot of information that's out there in Portland and we try to bring it together, kind of one-stop shopping. Uh, so the mission of the program is to engage and recognize urban homeowners when it comes to the removal of invasives, creating wildlife habitat, and gardening sustainably. We launched citywide in Portland in 2009. We expanded into Lake Oswego in 2011. And we have over 1,700 people in this program. And we cover about 350 urban acres that are participating in this program, either in progress or, in cert or certified. Okay? 
We are looking for expansion, and it's always about the bottom line and fundraising, but we're really hopeful that's going to happen. We have a long list of people outside of Portland and Lake Oswego that are eager to um, participate in this program. So, so what do you get? What is this program? So you can either sign up through the Audubon or Columbia Land Trust webpage. I have brochures in the back. You then will um, have a backyard habitat technician that will contact you and schedule a visit on your property. It takes about an hour and we'll walk around the property with you and we'll look for ways that would be maybe in the back area that you don't typically use would be great for habitat. Or did you know that this plant right here is actually a really bad noxious weed and we can advise you about how to remove that. Um, you also get a bunch of information that um, is to help you in order to get certified. And I'll go through that criteria in a little bit. We send out a quarterly e-newsletter that captures tons of native plant sales and workshops and events that go in our region. I mean, did you know that there are free naturescaping classes that you can sign up for through East Multnomah Little Water Conservation District? Or there's these plant sales in the spring outside of this program where you can buy natives one and two dollars. But if you don't know what's out there, um, it's hard to navigate it, so we bring it to you. You also get access to discounted material. You get a sign, which who is either certified or in progress? Raise your hand. Perfect audience. <laughs> who has seen this sign? Oh, that's kind of good. All right. So maybe we'll see how well I do tonight. You decide to sign up. Um, uh, you also get, when you get certified, you get a whole host of goodies. Um, you get like a packet to recognize your work from local businesses that want to um, support you. Total cost for the program is $25. It's a steal. Take me up on it. $25 for someone to visit your yard and talk to you about ways you can incorporate habitat. I have the easiest job around selling wildlife. It's great. Okay. So, a couple of the best resources I want to let you know about. The first is that our program offers a spring and fall native plant sale. These are only for folks that are enrolled in the program. Uh, these plants are basically wholesale. We go right to the native plant nurseries in our region and support them. Um, and we don't sell bare root. We actually only sell pots. And the reason is because pots can tend to, you can have better success. You can get a ton of plants at really cheap prices. So we sell about 8,000 plants a year through these sales. Is there anyone, raise your hand, who went on our Naturescaping for Backyard Habitats tour on Saturday? A couple people. Did, there was someone that picked up a swarm. That was you. That was you. Were you there? No, but oh. I, I saw the swarm. Okay. I saw the swarm on the bamboo, and I was right. so excited. I said, oh, actually, they are like, <laughs> They're getting bonus points tonight. That's the swarm. That's it. And and then you gave like an impromptu bee ecology talk. Well, yeah, because Tom and Robin, right? Yeah, yeah. Rob, Robin's garden. And so Tom works for the Arlene Schnitzer for the farming center, and so that swarm is going to go on top of the roots. So so I was just talking about that, and you know, and the, and the whole bee thing. So I saved my text from that. So a bunch of us were around visiting yards, and so they knew about that, so they texted. I thought that was so cool. So um, anyway, on Saturday, we had our annual tour. Uh, we had about 750 people on the tour. We had nine yards, and they were all over the city, and they reflected different, different pieces. They were all certified, um, food, um, honey, bees, um, forests uh, versus dense urban areas. So it's a great way. These are all do-it-yourselfers way to learn about how they did it and incorporate your interest in some of those elements into your own landscape. All right, there's the photo. I love it. Okay, so I'm assuming, I left it on the back table, but I have a sheet that talks about the certification level. So um, if you're interested in the program, grab that sheet. I'm gonna skim through this pretty briefly. Um, but there's three levels for certification, silver, gold, and platinum. Um, the certification criteria were actually developed by a committee of folks like biologists, landscape designers, stormwater management engineers, um, that really came together to look about to look at what would be realistic in someone's yard um, with the elements of the program. So these four elements are weeds throughout each level. Um, there's removal of invasive weeds, stormwater management, wildlife habitat, and native plants. Okay. 
So I'm going to talk about each one of those elements briefly, and then the last piece I'm going to show you some examples of common landscape um, installations that we have um, that we've seen. So invasive weeds. I, I never know as a group like how many folks are really knowledgeable on noxious weeds and those who aren't. But um, generally, <clears throat> weeds. Well, invasives cause about 1.6 to 1.8 billion dollars of damage. Um, per year, and that doesn't even include the impact that it has on water, food production, um, air, and noxious weeds cause environment, significant in environmental and economic damage. Within this program, we're looking at noxious weeds that have been identified by the city of Portland, um, and they're ones that are really common that are on our list, like ivy, blackberry, vinca, and then there's ones that are new threats. Um, Robert's geranium, stinky bob, many people may know, but that actually is that's a pretty bad plant. Garlic mustard, Japanese knotweed. The back of the sheet has the graph, it has about 32 weeds that are on the list. And what can be really overwhelming for a homeowner is that they have a number of weeds and then they're like, I don't know what to do. So I'm going to go to Home Depot and I'm going to get the worst toxic herbicide to kill it, and then I'm going to put it on the wrong time of year and it's going to continually grow. So what can be helpful in this program is that we go to your home, we help you identify those weeds, and then we give you the best research when it comes to how to remove that weed so you can be successful, okay? So there's certain weeds for silver you have to remove. Just think ivy and blackberry. There's some for gold, and then there's some for flat. Are there any questions about that? Okay. All right, so that's the first element. The second element are native plants. Some where you need to incorporate native plants into your landscape. And not just natives, but think about if you walk through Forest Park. You have tall trees, and you have understory trees, and you have tall shrubs, and you have small shrubs, and then you have ground cover. Those five layers of vegetation, um, we look at those within your backyard and those plants to incorporate. So for silver, just 5% of your plantable space has natives. For gold, 15. And for platinum, 50. Now I'm not, I'm maybe pushing natives, but you don't have to go to platinum. I'm gold, I have kids and a dog, and that, that fits for our family. So you don't have to do a lot. Just 5% of your yard has to have natives. And then think about those different layers of vegetation because for example this photo in the top left illustrates different wildlife will use different um, heights of plants in your backyard. So I have, I have a huge duck fur in my backyard. There's birds that use that versus there's different birds that are using the ground. So included this slide about what's native. And this is a really, in my field, this is a hot question. What does it mean? It could be native to North America. It could be native to Oregon, Pacific Northwest. So for this program, we're looking at Willamette Valley natives. So here's a you know, diagram of Oregon. And here's the Willamette Valley, number three. And if you're not familiar with an eco-region, re eco -region, it's an area of the, of, it's like within our state that shares the same temperature, soil type, elevation, um, a number of different factors. And so the plants that live in the Willamette Valley are ones that have evolved in our area before European settlement, okay? So what we use for what's native and not is, if you're familiar with the Portland plant list, this is a free document online. And it gives a ton of information about historically what plants were here. Um, and, uh, yeah, so this is, a, we use this resource all the time, and it's free. The other one, which is not free, but I think this is fascinating, I brought it tonight. We're really blessed. Um, when there was first settlement in Oregon, there was a survey done of the vegetation, and this was put out um, by the Native Plant Society of Oregon, and it's Urbanizing Flora of Portland, Oregon, very specific to our area. So there's great historical documents on what plants used to be here. All right, and the last, the last thing I'm going to say about this native plant is if you're familiar, I have it in the back, um, an entomologist, University of Delaware, his name is Doug Talmy, and his book that he wrote is on the top right. Thankfully, he was an entomologist, and he just so happened to purchase a property, and it had a bunch of ornamental plants, and he started to incorporate native plants into his landscape and saw a significant change when it comes to the insects that were there, 
And then he started to track it, collect research. And what he found out, and what he writes about in this book, about of all the animal species on our planet, 37% of them are, tell me about this word, herbivorous, herbivorous, herbivorous insects, which means on a food pyramid, they're the, they're the bottom, okay? Like in oceanography, think about a blue whale. They eat krill. That's an arthropod, okay? So 37% of all animals are those insects. 90% of all insects are specialized, which means that they only exist where native plants exist. They share a co-evolutionary history. And 96% of terrestrial birds rear their young on insects. Okay, so I'm not going to I mean, bees are incorporating that, but just think about how we're building that food pyramid. If you don't have native plants somewhere in your landscape, you're not going to have the insects, and you're not going to bring in the other wild plants. If anyone's interested in this book, by the way, I'll leave my card and give you 30% off and free shipping. <laughs> All right. So the for my third element, stormwater management. So before, think about your backyard. Before your home was there, before your backyard was there, what was it there beforehand? And with the amount, incredible amount of rainfall that we get in our area, historically, it used to just be absorbed through the ground that would be filtered and go into our streams. Well, what's now happened in the urban area is that there's a lot of impervious pavement. And so all that rainwater that flows, it either flows into channels that go into our great infrastructure in our city that we have to invest a lot of money in to, in, to, to take care of it, or it collects all those pollutants and it goes down into our creeks and then eventually into our rivers. So ultimately, what we want to do is we want to be able to manage as much stormwater on our property as possible. So some of the examples that we have within the certification that we suggest you do to take care of this, you can have a tree on your property. That counts. You can disconnect your downspout if it's appropriate, and you can install a rain garden. You can stop using pesticides, and you could garden organically. Even one of those things, by just doing it, you qualify for certification within this element. Really simple things, okay? And the last element is just wildlife habitat. I mentioned where we live is right in the middle of the Pacific Flyway. Millions of birds fly over where we live. And of the 500 bird species that use Oregon as their home, 209 of those use the Vancouver Portland area for some time of its life, of, of its life. almost half. So the things that you can do in your landscape are um, this, this is Tim Miller. So this is, he did a cross cut, these are all mason bee holes, mason bees that were using it. Um, this is another mason bee that um, Mary Kelly built right by her back door. I know you all are bee people. It drives me crazy when people are afraid of bees. Like in the fact that she was on the garden tour and was having this right by her front door, her back door, I hope taught people not to be afraid. Um, and this last piece, this is in my backyard, and it's not a bird bath, although a bird bath is an option. Someone gave this to me. It's a bug bath. And it looks really big. It's not. My iPhone was right on top of it. But I have this now in my meadow, in my parking strip. And I'm getting little insects that are using that little uh, amount of water to drink from in these really hot days. So really fun thing. You just have to do one of these. Bird bath, maybe bee house, to qualify for, um, for certification. All right. The last piece is just snags. I want to put in a plug for snags. Snags are nurse logs. You see these in the forest when there's a tree that's dead and it's decaying. And it is crazy the amount of wildlife that uses a snag or a nurse log. So instead of having a flicker use a telephone, telephone pole, which has a bunch of creasy um, for its home, wouldn't it be really cool if we had snags um, instead in the urban landscape? All right. Enough on my high horse. Okay, so let's look at a few native landscapes. So, so here's the stick. This is not brain science. This is really easy, and this is what our technicians advise homeowners all the time. Okay? So mimic natural um, habitats in your own landscape. Do you already have an existing large tree in your backyard? Let's pick some plants that could complement that tree. Or are you starting from scratch and you have food production, and you want to have a native meadow to increase pollination and support your beehives? Um, 
So diversifying but your plants, okay? So you can have deciduous plants that lose their leaves. You can have plants that stay evergreen. You can have plants that are vines. You can have plants that are shrubs. Um, you can have fences that instead of separate our homes uh, are open so birds can move through them. Um, instead, I've seen some beautiful designs with open fences. Uh, so I guess the bottom line with this is just right plant, right place. And this is what's taught in this nature escaping classes. Many homeowners feel like they're crappy homeowners, I mean crappy gardeners, because I buy plants and they die. Well, more than likely, you're buying the wrong plant for the wrong space. And so we work with you to help, to help make those decisions where you can be successful. Okay. Um, oh, okay, oh, I love the photo. So, native plant communities. This is this Portland plant list that I mentioned. Inside, it has all these different plant communities that used to be here or that are still here. So, like the Western Hemlock Dug Fir Forest, that's Forest Park. And in this book, it lists all the plants, trees, and shrubs, and ground cover that would be in that plant community. Okay? Um, what I love about this photo is that uh, she lives in Southeast and she found out she used to live in a historic oak habitat. So she sent me this photo of she bought an Oregon oak that's sticking out of her BMW. <laughs> love Oregon oak. Alright. So what we're trying to do is take natural systems and in large areas and incorporate them into small lots. So um, meadowscaping is really popular. People want to get rid of the grass, and they want to be able to support bees, they want to have beautiful blooms. So this is a project called the Portland, we just renamed it Portland, um, Urban, no, it's Pacific Northwest Urban Meadowscaping, PNAM, it used to be PUM, Portland Urban Meadowscaping. And what we have are a bunch of scientists that are coming together to look at native plants and which ones would do well in like uh, front yards and parking strips. So this photo right here, is taken outside of the Dells. This was just conserved this spring. It's called the Forest Sisters. It's about 150 acres of beautiful lupin and balsam root to know that this is going to be conserved forever through Columbia Land Trust. Okay, we've taken that. This is my parking strip. Hopefully that photo looks okay. But I have beautiful Sedelcia and Yarrow. Yesterday I had a dragonfly, my first one in my parking strip. I was so excited. I'm trying to find somebody to call and tell them. Um, and then this is just a few homes down. This is a na another native meadow, a native buttercup. He has some mallows right here, some bunch grasses. So just thinking differently about how we can use our yard. Printed, I have great lists of turf replacement and meadow native plants, and I've left them in my printer today. I'm so sorry. But if you're interested, I can send you this list. We're researching this list right now. Xerces is a part of this Panam, as well as Portland Park, um, West Multnomah, a bunch of folks. Um, and we're vetting this list right now. But these are great plants. I've been experimenting them with them in my parking strip. Um, and for bees, it would be a great thing to add. So this is my youngest daughter. We went, we went to that Forest Sisters um, property this spring. And if you're familiar with Richard Lube's book called Nature Deficit Disorder, working in the environmental field for over 20 years, um, I worry about our true disconnect from nature and how that's affecting kids. So he um, writes about nature deficit disorder, and I just wanted to share briefly. When we went out to Four Sisters' property, I have two kids. They were complaining the whole way about wanting to use my iPhone or their Kindle. And um, on the way back, once we sat in the Four Sisters all day, they stared out the window and didn't ask for anything. And it was beautiful. And I've seen this for two decades. And just to see in my own kids just reinforces how important it is to be outside and to connect with nature, not some, what, somewhere far away. She ended up cutting me a bouquet of flowers from my meadow, which I was horrified in the beginning because I was worried about the bees and they weren't going to have enough bloom. But then I thought, wait, that's the point, right? That's the point. My daughter getting excited about these plants. So I thought that was really cute. All right. The last installation of typical homeowners who have these big, tall trees and worry about them and want to get rid of them. Um, and instead, if the tree is healthy, we can look at these plant communities with the homeowner and we give you specific suggestions about what you can add in the understory. And it is amazing how much wildlife not just use the tree, but the plants underneath. The last thing this program we're working in is not just in people's backyards, but in community spaces. 
Um, this was a meadow that was installed at a Sunnyside school in Southeast Portland. They got rid of some ornamental plants and are experimenting with some of these same seeds. Um, this photo, photo, but uh, Portland Garden Club recently got certified. Um, this was at the Smile Station. Kenton Firehouse is also certified. And this is, I'm going to go there this Saturday. Uh, this is Ma Olson's Garden in Linton. And they are at the bottom of Forest Park. And the whole community has come together to restore um, an area right along um, 30. And while we take no recognition for that, it was so nice to award them that sign after all the work they had done. So there's a lot of creative spaces in which we can certify. So I got, I've gotten this question a lot. Um, does one yard really make a difference? And Doug Hallamy really says um, that we have been slow to recognize the unprecedented importance that um, urban backyards can play in supporting biodiversity. So I hope by these next last few slides I can demonstrate what it isn't just one yard. So this is a map of Washington above, Oregon below, and here's the Columbia, Columbia River going out to the Pacific Ocean. And all these little yellow spots are just pieces of land that Columbia Land Trust has conserved about 20,000 acres. This is a close-up of the Portland metropolitan area. Here's the Columbia and the Willamette. And this photo is old. These are the 1,700 people that are in this program. So we're making more connections. It's not just one backyard. It's a whole community. So if you're feeling like, why does one yard really make a difference if I do this, I can really give you a good case for why your backyard really does make a difference. All right, so there's our partners. Thank you very much. We, we have just a few minutes for a couple of questions, and I just want to reinforce what you said, Galen. I, uh, another one of our members, Tom Lee, always says he had been teaching classes for years and telling beekeepers that, you know, well, what should I plant in my yard? What kind of plants do the bees like? And what's an important plant to have in my yard? He goes, ah. For years, it, it doesn't really matter what you do. The bees are, you know, it's not going to make an impact, you know. And he thought, and I've been doing that for the last 25 years and telling them, yeah, these are the plants you need to plant. These are the great pollinating plants. Then it would be like your last slide there, that, you know, it would have expanded and the people that he'd been telling 20 years ago now would have these habitats that the bees could forage on. So uh, thanks a lot, you guys. Now, what, five minutes yeah. for questions? All right. All right. Will this work in Washington? No, uh, we Washington State has their own program. Um, you can go to the State of Washington website, just like I think Backyard Washington State. They don't come out to your home, um, but they do have a program, which is why we haven't expanded um, into Washington. And uh, you can still sign up, though. We, that monthly e news doesn't matter where you live. I mean, you could live anywhere, and if you can get here to get plants, um, just to get on that list. garden doesn't require pesticides um, and supporting bees. Yes. All right. In the uh, where can we find the Portland uh, plant list? So if you just Google Portland plant list, um, it'll come up. It's a PDF. It's on the City of Portland website. Um, I will say, I just want to give a caveat. This was um, put together based on mitigation. So if you were doing anything on your property that was like in a natural area, it was this is the list that you're supposed to use. But now, with 1,700 people, many more people, more than 1,700 back here, are using this. So what I like about it is I like the plant communities. I like that it has like everything you need. Um, it can be, it's a big document, so I suggest printing it out and going through it. Um, but yeah, it's really easy. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
I have five acres that's, I believe, south of anything that was on your map. But uh, I'd like to landscape the acre around the house with uh, native plants. Is, can I take advantage of your identification service of uh, identifying what are the non-native plants, what I should take out? Um, well, if we did a site visit, we would definitely do that. We would look for areas of habitat. We would look for weeds, and, and if there's the 32 weeds that are on our list, if you have those, we'd give you information on how to remove them. It's a really comprehensive report that you get afterwards, if I didn't say that, that summarizes you know, what happens on your property. I may not have mentioned, I apologize. So this program is an urban program, so we work with homeowners one acre or less. So once you get beyond one acre, it's really beyond their level of expertise because that's a, it's more of a natural area. Um, but I would encourage you, East Multnomah, the Water Conservation District has these free nature scaping classes. We list them all the time in our e-news. But that can be a really good start if you're interested in understanding what you would like to do. volunteers that call, like what you said, uh, homeowners that are on our list asking if they have questions. And so um, what I would suggest, we, we try, if it's just a follow-up visit, it gets really, um, there's only two of us that do this and we have four attacks, but um, we really can't do second visits unless you're really ready for certification. But if you have questions and you're not sure um, if you're ready or not, what else I need to do, contact Nikki West. She's my co-manager, and she works for Audubon, and she takes care of the certification visits. So to contact her, email phone, and just let her know where you're at, and then she can walk you through that. Yeah. All right. Yes. Yeah. This is a back and forth between canopy and garden. You know, the, the battle between the shade and the canopy that we might want to create. Yeah. This is what's the future of our garden under? Any comments about? like shade versus sun yes. in, in that evolution in yes. your yard. Um, I believe that you can do, I have a 5,000 square foot lot, and I have my big duck fir and a forest in the back. My front yard, I have sun, and my parking strip is where I have my meadow. I don't have any, um, I, don't have, I don't have enough sun for food, really. I, it's just not working. But I guess, you know, it just depends on what you want. And that's where we could talk to you about what your goals are for the property. Um, but, you know, shade... My, my uh, air conditioning bill has plummeted now that my trees have gotten much bigger um, and the amount of wildlife has increased as those have evolved. So um, I think you can do both in small lots, but you have to be realistic. I don't know if that helps. That's just my opinion. I'll bring you out. I have a short question. Are you involved yeah. with Colwood site? The which site? Colwood, Golf Course. There's some land trust. I know it's probably or somebody else in, uh, in northeast Portland. Oh, I don't it's know. It's coming up for a hearing. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, no. No, I don't think it was Columbia Land Trust. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'll be around with you. Okay, so more bee plants. The more bee plants, more honey, more foraging. So we're going to take a short break. Uh, so there will be there's some snacks and goodies. Uh, again, uh, compliments of Mark in the back. And uh, and then we'll uh, follow up with uh, Dr. Karen will be here to do a Q&A here. About, oh, let's take... Maybe 15 minutes at the most. Okay? <laughs>
I think you put it in, Rod. I think it looks like it looks like it was a place that, that when I went back, it looked, looked like you said if you have a swarm, it looked like if you have a swarm, you'll tell people that you have one. And that's we well, you know, and a really good swarm list is actually to spend the twenty five dollars a year and go to the Oregon State Beekeepers Association, and you give you know you give John your twenty five bucks, and it's January one, it's an annual thing. So put your calendar. Thank you. 
they're nearby. Yeah. Um, I mean, they could be flying all the way over from the Eco Village too, because it's so close to them. But, hi, um, I'm not sure where have to go that far because there's so many, you know, they probably can go all year. I mean, if they find stuff, if, but if they find stuff close, they might not go all the way over here. And it may be that there's so high, and two that we're going to go from other than, and plus, um, we set up, uh,
Uh, let's, uh, we're going to wrap up the uh, break and we're going to start our Q&A session here real quick. So if everybody wants to take their popcorn to their seats. Okay, is everybody ready? Okay, uh, Dr. Curran, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Get your questions ready. Uh, yeah, I'll use the mic. Okay, fine. For those that might be interested, here is something very different. Uh, are you a science hobbyist? Uh, a person at North Carolina State University has a, a project with some funding, National Science Foundation, to help um, uh, Science educators and researchers understand how to better teach science in schools, museums, and how to design better community-based science programs, something we've been talking about. If you have an interest, here's a, uh, 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 you can do this survey. Um, the person, uh, Gail, said that she hadn't had anyone from Oregon. Now, I've used this at a couple meetings, so perhaps by now someone's trying to. But if you think this fits you, um, there is something very, very different. Uh, in addition to um, uh, the the North uh, the treatment free bee conference that is again the end of next month Pacific Warner College Tom Sealy Kirk Webster Debbie Delaney and Lanny Kirby are all part of the program and one of our own from Pub also is on that particular program. Did we want to say something about Matt? Is Matt, Matt still here? Matt is still. Yes. Yeah, please. You Oh, this, uh, I'm, I'm nervous about giving Matt the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> by the first of July, if you register by the first of July, you save a little bit, so we're um, uh, on your registration. So I think we've already covered it, so I'll just stand here and look good. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so we've got, I think, uh, Dr. Tom Seeley, who wrote Honey Bee Democracy, is coming out. I'm sure some of you have seen that book. I've never heard him speak, but I've heard he's amazing. Um, Melanie Kirby, I think Lynn Royce, uh, which she's spoken here, she's going to be there. Um, I'll be talking about warrior hives. There's going to be workshops, hands-on. Uh, we'll be bringing topper hives, warrior hives, Langstroth hives. We'll be going into hives. Um, so I think it should be a really cool event. And uh, most of you are in town, so you'll save a little, little bit of money so you don't have to stay there. Um, I don't have much else to say, I don't think. And you can sign up on our webpage. I don't know what Melissa covered, but I'll try and answer your question. I saw you save some money, but I didn't see what the cost was. I think it, at this point, I think it's two ten or one ninety or two ten. One ninety now, if you don't stay in the dorm. And I think that includes uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner on Saturday. And no, breakfast, no breakfast, lunches, I think, and uh, it's no dinner on Sunday. Okay. Um, and I think all your meals are covered Saturday, but you can figure that out. And there's also music if you like that. Music. Yeah. Good. All right, thank you. Now I'll let him ramble on. That's the shortest time I've had Matt on the microphone. <laughs> Good job, Matt. Another event coming in uh, uh, the uh, week of uh, Labor Day, Saturday, September 7th, Randy Oliver. Randy writes extensively for the journals. His uh, website, Scientific Beekeeping, has very extensive reviews of uh, most recently you know, all the reasons why or issues related to bee death. Nozema, um, and most particularly also, he's been reviewing the whole issue of pesticides most recently. Um, and he does apologize that uh, he, does, he isn't favoring, he feels he's not in one or the other of the camp, so that he's trying to present a really an unbiased uh, uh, review of some of the material in terms of pesticides. <laughs> uh, that price ticket, I think, is going to be 25 35 for uh, reserved seating, so you can go off and shake his hand after. I'm just going to mention, I think it's actually Pacific University and not Pacific Warner. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Pacific, yeah, right there on uh, Route 6 in the uh, Warner. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fitting right in, uh, with Gail, uh, interest of Galen, um, there is a big movement in Europe for uh, bug condos, bee condos, uh, insect hotels. It has any of these names. Uh, uh, bee and hops, uh, solitary bee walls, etc. Here is a look at uh, some of those. 
Um, we're talking about backyard habitat and providing uh, appropriate habitat for bees. Many of these will, will particularly work. Look at uh, this particular one, both a native and then an insert for the for you know the different sizes attract different species of our native our native bees. So you don't necessarily have to go out and buy one of these expensive uh, mason bee houses. You can sort of create some of your own. The other that these attract are things like lace wings and also lady beetles, which are among the, 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 the good guys. So here's some ideas. Uh, I sent this link to Tim. Um, uh, this is this is uh, to the point in, in parts of Europe, the UK, et cetera, where it's art. It is backyard art. Wouldn't that be nice to have that in one of the houses? Inviting nature in. The Insect Hotels. If you Google that, um, there's a great site that has all these illustrations. Um, if you would like me to send it to you directly, um, I would be glad to, or Tim can send it on to you. Tim also has a time. Uh, last month we did this issue. That was the losses. Andrew had a, um, uh, a, um, a handout for you. And so I asked Andrew for the data on the losses, the first couple of questions. Um, this is the spread in terms of the number of colonies by the pub members, um, the 28 individuals that, that gave Andrew a, a, uh, a survey. So um, the, uh, there were six individuals that had a single colony. This is this blue bar. Um, 10 individuals that had two colonies. And that was the medium for, the, for this group, for the group of the 28 individuals that these were people that had overwintered, and so we were looking in terms of losses. Of the 28 individuals, seven had no losses. So the second uh, represents here, of the six individuals, four lost, there were four colonies lost. So four of the six, okay, and two didn't have a loss. Um, the 10 colonies, a couple uh, had two colonies, a couple lost one colony, some lost all the colonies. Um, so a bit of the distribution in terms of, of those particular losses. Total losses for the group were 53 for the 28, uh, I'm sorry, the 21 individuals, but uh, what I present here is the weighted loss, that is for all 28 individuals. So that includes the individuals that had no loss, as well as those that had losses, the 21 individuals who lost 53, ranged from one colony to six colonies. Um, so that was a 42% loss within the city. Now, um, and Andrew's uh, form, which I don't have a copy, and he has the information, also asked some questions in terms of, of, of I think he's going to be able to, to say a little bit more as to whether this might have been a first-year colony or, or whatever. My form, I don't have that, uh, I don't have that information. But I'm also <laughs> the group of uh, the part of this B loss, uh, the, 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 the national group, the, the uh, B in form, this is uh, what, what our beekeepers routinely say is an acceptable level up to around 15% winter losses. And that's our historical losses. You know, bee colonies are living, going entities, and things happen to them. Um, uh, we had a, a very remarkable year last year, um, the lowest loss that we've had in our seven years. Unfortunately, the back this year is back to our just about our average for the seven years that we've been doing this nationally, the, the uh, numbers that we are involved this past year, we had 6,300 respondents, good response from Oregon. Um, I haven't gotten the original data yet, but it's coming. Uh, about 23% of the colonies managed across the U.S. Uh, and you can see the numbers back into the 30% range. The average for these uh, uh, last seven years is 30.5 one-third of the colonies, roughly one-third of the colonies. So if we're looking at the pub group with those individuals, um, including those that didn't have losses at 42%, that's saying in Portland City, in the, in the uh, for where most of you in Cage had colonies, we're experiencing higher than normal losses. However, when you uh, slice and dice this one other way, um, I was asking for the information from Andrew because I'm also looking at uh, the information across all of our different associations. This represents this past year. This is our, the blue are our national numbers. The red is a survey that uh, Aramish and I have been doing. Notice how the numbers of our commercial, semi-commercial beekeepers, these three red bars, had been going down. And we were hoping, we were thinking that, gee, maybe we're, we're around the corner maybe in terms of the, the extensive 
money to be losses. But you can see that this number then inched back up another you know, uh, roughly 10% over the previous year. Now, recall this year, um, in 2012, we had an incredibly great um, spring in 46 of the 48 states, Oregon and Washington were the two exceptions. But the rest of the country had an incredibly early spring. But what happened, of course, is that colonies weren't really tested. Roamites, um, the colonies grew fast. They grew out of Roamites. And so what, what happened, and it was everyone was predicting, well, next year it's going to be heavy, and indeed it was, because we had a lot of colonies that weren't really, really tested by Roamites. Um, they grew earlier. Uh, we had them not only a very good spring, but then we had a very poor fall. There was drought in over half of the, uh, the continental United States, again, not on the Pacific coast, but in the rest of the, uh, the U.S. And so there were a number of factors working against our needs. You'll recall that this year was also a very poor year, uh, but, uh, but not so here. Anyway, it turns out that your loss level of the 28 individuals at 42% was also the loss level of 156 backyard beekeepers. Largest colony number represented in this last bar was 40, 40 colonies. The highest number here in Pub was someone who said they, they had over 130 colonies. So, um, although higher than certainly the, the large commercial beekeepers doubled, um, it was and 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 high certainly 42 percent is nothing. Um, that that's that's tough, that's tough to make up losses. Um, it was also the right where we found the level for. Our, our remaining uh, hey, do we, what does that mean, acceptable losses in that last chart before that? The acceptable is what we, in our surveys, we're asking individuals, what would you consider in your operation an acceptable loss? So that's pre-2008 or something? And like that's that? an average. No, this, this is essentially where it comes out every single year. Among our commercial beekeepers this year, uh, this will be in um, our V-Line editors here, Rosanna, uh, this is where this article will be there this next month, but this level here now, the commercial beekeepers are saying at 10%, and yet you can actually see that they were about double what they said was an acceptable level. So although that's, that's good news relative to national levels and backyard levels, that, that level, it's not good news for them when they consider half the level as an acceptable level of loss. Okay, to try to have to make up. <coughs> No, not necessarily. That's a great question. Were all of these these pub numbers from uh, people that uh, were were all this was all their first year, and that information Andrew has a better handle on, um, and he didn't share it with me, but uh, he did share the people in this group that had had a count some colonies the year before, and by and large, a number of these people had had colonies. I'm not saying they had the same colony. Uh, but they've had colonies, the vast majority of those 28 individuals that, that, that say that. And the only way I can tell is because uh, of the 28 individuals, I think there were only seven of those individuals that hadn't had a colony the year before. That was on the survey form that Andrew would ask you. Now, I think he asked questions in terms of, of, of was it a nuke or were you, your colonies nukes or swarms or whatever. I haven't been asking that information, so so that's a very valuable piece of information <coughs> that I'm sure he will get back to you with that information. We put this information, uh, Tim did, on the uh, Facebook, right? So, yeah. yeah, and I will uh, work, I'm working with Andy Dewey, and we'll try and get that information uh, organized in, uh, back out on Facebook. So what's the theory? So what's the theory why the backyarders lost so much? Uh, pick a theory, and it's as good as any other at this particular point. Why double the large-scale beekeepers? Uh, that's, a, that's a huge difference. Uh, some of it is uh, certainly, you know, the, the, the new beekeepers, a large number are in that particular group, uh, lower experience level. And one of the others is, a, is an artifact of the survey, and that is all of our large-scale beekeepers and all but a couple of the semi-commercials send their bees and make money from their bees in almond pollination. 
That's February. So they are working in their bees. They must work in their bees in January. In the backyard, we're not. We're looking out the window still at them. And there's very rarely that we'd be in them in January or February or even March any year. This year, a little bit different. Um, so they're picking up these, these dates. They're picking up these colonies that are just not, not really strong colonies earlier. And virtually all of them are overwintering now nukes. And so they have the possibility for um, dumping in, combining a new colony with a standard colony to bring it up to speed. Because all of them pollination requires exceedingly strong colonies for that for February. They need to average 8.5 trains of brood. Normally, colonies are, are in the three to four, maybe five range. Normally. So they have to work with their colonies to have to bring them up to speed. So those are just a, a few things. I wish we could get at this better. We have a, you know, you saw 6,300 participants in the national survey. The national survey additionally has a management survey with it, and so we have some of that information there. Uh, I know you could drill down forever, but how about location of the world? Location of the loss. Um, the um, southern part of the valley had uh, only about half the level of loss of, uh, well, 30% compared with 40% in the northern, and 50% in the northern part of the county. Of the or possible, it's, it's, again, if it's a pollution issue, it would not be helpful to figure out where, if, if in fact there is a you know, center of loss and where yeah. it's occurring. Yeah. National, we now um, have three years of data into the, the uh, online. We can slice and dice that information. So now we can start looking at near, near locations that had corn or near locations that were in agriculture versus locations that were not. Um, unfortunately, and some of that is, is still a little imprecise in that it may not be important uh, and it may be very critical in August what you're next to. If you're near, um, uh, over in, in the in Madras area, uh, you're over near the uh, seed pollination, that's where your bee colonies are doing their work at that time of year, um, you have a greater risk of getting those colonies through winter versus if you have a timeout. And all of our Oregon commercial beekeepers feel bees have got to have a timeout. And the time of the timeout is not June or, or, or May, but most critically August. And just think of our state in August. Where can you go in August to, to find a smorgasbord of, of flowering plants suitable for thousands of colonies of bees? I mean, not just, just a colony two. For us in the city, that, that is still the city because there are still lots of flowering things that are available. Um, would you like to have uh, move in, you know, three or four commercial beekeepers, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 colonies into the city to take advantage of the same habitat we have. Um, beekeepers in, in some parts of the country kill, um, purposely, intentionally kill other colonies with pesticides of, of people that moved in on them. So. What, was, uh, was the question asked of uh, backyarders whether uh, there was honey or not in their dead house? The question asked is, is there honey or not in their dead house? Uh, I do not on my survey. Um, we do with our, our, our interactive um, web survey, uh, we are asking that type of question. We're asking are there dead bees that are present uh, on bottom board in cells or absence of dead bees. Um, so we're, we're indirectly getting at it there. They, and the reason why the question or behind the question is that our, we asked beekeepers to say why they think they had that level of losses. So all 28 individuals on, on my survey indicated that. That wasn't on Andrew's survey, but uh, um, on mine they do. And it's all over the board. Weak in the fall, pesticides, CCD, um, small high beetle. We don't have an estate. That was checked by someone. Makes me wonder. <laughs> Yellow jackets are frequently, are not frequently, are listed. Um, and so, so that issue in terms of could it have been starvation, in other words, absolutely no honey left in the frames, versus a colony that, that is dead, but there's still honey evidence, uh, evidence of honey in the frame.
the problem that one question doesn't eliminate some things. That could still be CCD, it could be starvation, it could be too small a population. But it gets the, it does drill it down to a narrower answer. Yeah. Um, and with Gail's uh, comments earlier, I had put that on the very first slide. If you're interested in particular plants for pollinators, there's a fantastic resource that's Kathy Pendergrass, and it's Plants for Pollinators. And it's, uh, it's the group, the, uh, um, um, the Soil Conservation Service. She works for a Soil Conservation Service. If you Google it and can't find it, uh, email me, and I'll be glad to get that to you. Um, she was talking about metals and bees. Here is my publication, Metals um, and Buffers for Bees. We did this with the Soil Conservation Service uh, a number of years before I came out west. And with Doug Talley, um, this is our farm management for native bees. And, and the Xerces Society liked it so much they went for farming for bees. Um, and that would answer the question about you have a larger acreage. I think uh, uh, Frank asked about uh, five acre. This would, this would the, some of the comments in here would be perhaps a little bit more appropriate uh, for a larger acreage. They, uh, the, the National Conservation Society has a service, which is part of your, your tax money for out of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And Xerces Society has, uh, for example, hedgerow planning, how to, to try to incorporate hedgerow planning, and then a native bee conservation pollinator habitat. So for some of these things that might not uh, work in terms of Columbia Land Trust, think perhaps Xerces Society for some of these other resources, or combine the two resources and you'd have a very powerful uh, um, you know, background material uh, as, 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 as indicated. Um, you know, there's no one size fits all. It's like beekeeping, backyard habitats is no one size fits all, but it's, it's changing our, what's there, what's available for our bees for wild and honeybees one backyard at a time, and, and as indicated with that many participants in, the, in this program, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of us, a lot of us that are involved in, in doing that actively. Hey, do we, those yes. pamphlets you were just pulling up, are those uh, at cost, or can they be ordered? The Xerces Society generally are, are very inexpensive at cost. Okay. Um, uh, in addition to Doug Palamy's book, Doug and I are working temporaries at, uh, in fact, he replaced me as the partner chairman at Delaware. Um, his, uh, his, his book, um, Xerces Society also has a, a, I think it's under $25 book in terms of uh, pollinator habitat as well. So, but these are generally at cost. All right, our Q&A. What are we should be doing in June? Um, what's our to-do list in June? What should be on our list? Uh, this is Tim's backyard. Uh, supering um, and, uh, and colony queen ripeness issues. So, with that as a background, anyone want to, who, who, who has the first question? Mm -hmm. Are we done or two? Yes. You talked about um, laying workers. Laying workers. Mm -hmm. uh, can I talk about laying workers? Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, when a colony goes queen less, and then they do for a lot of reasons, um, unless they quickly are able to replace her initially with a virgin queen, say, as a swarming super procedure, and the queen mates uh, within a week, uh, letting workers develop. And so, if it's for something happens in that very critical two weeks after a queen is not there, before a new queen is there laying eggs, if something happens in that, um, the worker are, are already beginning to develop ovaries. Those are called laying workers. And so if they then start, um, without the influence of a queen, to their ovaries develop, and some of them start laying eggs, it's a, it's a pretty rapid downhill spiral. Very difficult, very, very difficult to pre-queen a laying worker colony. You can spend a lot of money on a very fancy queen and, and watch as the bees kill her. Um, Transferring a frame of root from a, a colony, another colony, your neighbor's colony, if you only have one colony. But a frame of root is let the bees try to get it sorted out. Let the bees try to rear their own queen. That usually works better than trying to put a queen into what we consider a laying worker colony. Clues to a laying worker colony? Mm, there aren't a lot of them. Um, multiple eggs in cells, eggs on the side of the cells, eggs, multiples of, set of eggs four or five eggs in a cell. But that's 
uh, seriously laying where it commonly. Initially, the early stages is where it's very critical to pick up, and you can spend a lot of time and effort and money on cleaning and get nowhere to, to re-clean that colony. So my recommendation is go natural. Go back and let the bees sort it out. Give them a frame of open room from another colony, from a selected colony, a colony that you'd like to stock, a and colony that's doing everything. And free. brand new eggs. Right. And brand new eggs. And brand new eggs. And if, if, if they're going to kind of conquer their laying worker problem, let them do it. We we have so few skills as beekeepers to try to catch up with them. So there's more than one worker laying? More than one worker is laying. So some people say shake them on out and they'll stay out. No. At some point you gotta make a decision. Am I gonna try still to rescue this? Am I gonna spend money and time or just shake the bees out? Yeah, what about you got How do you combine a new nuke with laying workers? Um, what you would do is, is you might try to shake out, go walk in front of the colony, take the whole colony up, you know, all frames, and then shake the bees, not right in front of the, where the box is, not in front of the apron, but a distance away. The further you can get on your property or, or you know, um, go up, uh, you know, to someone else's property with their permission and do the same thing. <laughs> and the, the concept is the laying workers are too heavy because their ovaries have developed. They can't fly back, so you've got to go far enough to fly back. And so um, the, what you then are left with is the, the bees that can fly back uh, because they, you then take your empty box and put it back on the original stand. And at that point, then combine a new. Whenever you're combining a nuke and there's queen issues, you put newspaper between. So take your nuke, generally, generally, if the, the unit that you want to save the queen in is put on top, not on the bottom, generally the top unit is the one that has a better chance that the queen is not killed. So sometimes we'll combine two queen right colonies. We just captured two swarms. They probably both have a queen. Okay? We, they're not going to survive both queens. So generally the better, what might be the better queen, if that swarm goes on top. So a sheet of newspaper, if you've got very educated bees, then, then you know, um, use the, the Portland paper, or if, if not, get one of these from one of the vendors along the streets and use that newspaper, whatever, whatever works. And so the, the, the com combined with the unit on top, over newspaper. Let the bees slow down in, in, in uniting and getting back together. Will that work with a, a colony that has laying workers? Some, sometimes nothing works, absolutely nothing. But you got a shot at it. Glenn. What I do to uh, when I have laying workers is put a swarm on top of the laying worker colony with a screen bottom board between. And my screen bottom boards are much narrower than some of the commercial ones that are three inches tall. And the narrower ones are better because I leave it on for several weeks. And so not much fur comb is, is built in between there. But I put the queen right colony with a swarm on top and let the pheromones mingle between there. And then I'll go in after two weeks or so, or maybe more often just because I'm curious to see if the laying workers are continuing to lay eggs or if they're ceasing their production. But my theory is, is that with the pheromone from the new queen, you know, mingling with the laying workers, that their ovaries, they'll stop. And in fact, just today, I, well, I had started this process uh, maybe 10 days or, or two weeks ago, and we checked today, no eggs from, no eggs in the, the lower one. And so today, I removed the screen bottom board to combine them. And, oh, I love that. And, and what I have, and but what I do first is to take a frame from either one of them and just put it next to the other one to see if there's any fighting or anything going on. In fact, I tried this maybe uh, three weeks ago, and every time I took a frame down there, they were just fighting. They just didn't like it. And and the reason was because while well, there was a queen in both of them, so that was a clue, you know, that that it worked or it didn't work. I mean, the, the process worked because they didn't want to combine for good reason. And I've been very successful with this 
method, but of course it takes us some more. Yeah, or you actually you could do it with a new yeah, 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 well. could. Yeah, you could do it the yeah, way. Time right. Taking time, not rushing the process. Let the bees, um, That's let right. the bees tell you. Um, Glenn's idea to take a frame down is, is just simply see, it, it, you know, it, has there been some mingling of those odors? If you take that frame down, and immediately you see some tussling and fighting and balls of bees sort of just falling out of the entrance. No, they haven't had time yet. Or there's a queen. Which or there's a queen. Or there's, which is, was a good thing. Yeah. And then you can just go to the newspaper approach. Well, I, I don't use newspaper at all because. Yeah, I don't either, but. The I screen yeah. right. acts as a controlled newspaper, if you will. Right. I decide. As a, as a pheromone exchanger, right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes they'll just blow right through that newspaper, start chewing it right away. And so our hope for time to get used to it. Yeah, lost, lost that advantage. advantage. Yeah. That, that's very effective for just combining a queenless colony with a queen right colony, but yeah. laying workers is a difficult less one. Less with, the, with two queen colonies, two, you know, each of the queens or laying workers. Yes? I have three colonies, right. two of which are swarms this year, and this is now five days into blackberries in the forest area, so this is nirvana for the bees. They're really looking like strong colonies, but I'd rather end up with six or seven colonies than have honey. So can I just take the brood uh, and uh, split them in half uh, and have them make queens in the in the three uh, new colonies? Yeah, so we've got a, uh, a colony of two brood boxes. We can simply just do a deep divide, just take this top box, this half depth, off and put it on a bottom board. The queen is in one of them you, when you do that. The other part without a queen will then, by an emergency, raise a new queen. Okay. So that's a deep divide. What so, wait a minute, what? Well, uh, a deep divide, you just, you know, uh, versus a divide where you actually go in here, determine the strength of the colony and take one or two or three frames versus here, whatever is above for brood, whatever is below for brood. Now, this sometimes does not work in very small colonies because all the brood happens to be above and not below. It doesn't work early spring. And then the question, what about the... Yeah. What about drift? Um, you know, let the bees generally go where they're going to go. When you're doing a deep divide, do you make sure that you've got uh, brand new eggs in, the, in both boxes? So that when you separate them and the queens with one and the other one? No, initially... Initially you don't, and so sometimes a deep divide doesn't work because one of the boxes happens to be all very old brood on a lower box. Right. The queen's up above with all the young brood, so that colony is that half is, is in pretty good shape. The half down below was, you know, doesn't have the wherewithal to, to rear a new queen. Right. right. So so it does, I mean it, it's a, a quick and dirty way of trying to do it. Often works, but there are some instances. Nothing is 100 percent. This is a not the 100 percent case. Well, in that case, why wouldn't you just uh, switch the frames so that there was new? Well, then if you recognize that, switch the frames. But then you're going back and doing a more practice divide. So. But there's no reason not to do that. No, 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 not at all. That'd be more like a commercial operation approach, right? Where you've got like lots and lots to do. Yeah, and, and generally the commercial approach, and this is a, is a larger beekeeper's yard, uh, they've been doing some justifying uh, some back and forth anyway. And they're not worried about drift. And so, so they're trying to get brood in both boxes. So they will do that very quickly. Boom, they, they need, need more. Yes. Recognize right now that we are right at the point of the blackberry. Okay. After this, there there is not a lot of major nectar sources. There are continuing nectar sources, but not major sources for our bees. So if you're going to, to do some things like increasing colony numbers, haven't yet done it, now's the time to try to do it. Those colonies don't need all that brood. And in fact, some, some bees, some racial mix, mixtures of bees, particularly Italian bees, will continue to raise way too much brood now into July and, and sometimes right on into August. So by cutting them back at this point, um, you're not going to affect how much nectar really you, you, you have. The 
because that's a function of the these that are already born. Those are the foragers leaving today. Um, and so, so if, if you do anything with your biting, they're still going to be leaving tomorrow. Glenn. Sorry. Sorry. I, one of my colleagues is on a scale, a whole warehouse platform scale where you put the counterweight on and slide the thing. And so I brought my uh, weights here today and I'll very telling. Now this was a swarm, the first swarm that we picked up this year, March 30th. But they they built up pretty well. So on May 11th, the weight was 180 and a half pounds. <coughs> and, a half. and then by May 20th, it was 190 and a half. And then it started going down to the lowest it got to was on June 2nd. That's Week here, 182. So down from 190 and a half to 182. So they lost eight pounds in this cold, rain weather. Mm -hmm. well, it wasn't that cold, but rain weather. <coughs> and then they put on a half a pound, and then it stayed the same, even though we had nice weather. And then they put yesterday they put on a whole pound. So maybe it's reversed. <laughs> Okay, so here we are. We hit that frost. I did. I did harvest, you know, about 100 pounds from a colony. Some colonies got up and got very. We had an earlier spring, but then we hit that frost, and there there isn't a lot of bloom. The maples were a little bit earlier. Okay, scotch is a, is a, just a pollen source. Before raspberry came into bloom, now the now the blackberry. Uh, so. What Glenn is describing is they hit that trough, they went, they lost about 10 pounds during mm -hmm. the period. And now, hopefully, <laughs> since we're now starting with the heavy blackberry bloom, they're on this trajectory upwards, and, and that will only go a couple of weeks. In 52 weeks, on a scale high, we've got colonies gaining, generally, only two or three weeks. Good weeks are when they stay even. Yeah. Of course, bad ones are when they go down. <laughs> we're, we're maintaining our colonies 50 weeks, expecting two weeks of reward for all that work and attention and worrying and, and, and all the things we do with bees. If there's anything better that you can do with your life... <laughs> <laughs> It's worth it, yeah. Question. Um, what happens if you accidentally entrap the queen um, in the medium supers with the queen with the divider or the queen excluder? Here's our, our double box chamber. So we have a queen excluder on there, that's that line. What if the queen is up there? Okay. Our whole concept of supering is that the super is above. Part of the definition, but it's also extra for us. It's super amount over and above what they need. So we want the queen to be below. What if she's up above? And in that case, she is laying eggs in cells that we thought we wanted to have the bees put honey in. And so, so we're not working at all in sync. The answer is you've got to go into the supers, find her. And then either pick her up and put her down below the queen scooter or uh, put the frame that she is on. If you're not at all comfortable picking up a queen, you have to be careful. Um, but you can generally pick them up and run them down below the queen scooter. But if you're not comfortable, move the whole frame. Don't move the frame down. So, so that's the quick and easy answer um, in terms of doing that. Now, there might be other ways that that can be done. Since you now know where she is, um, that now becomes the brew chamber, and for best results, we want the brew chamber at the bottom. So now you, you now you would go ahead and take the box that, that she is in and put the, that box down below, and you might then elevate one of these up above, provided your extractor can handle the you know the standard frame, provided you haven't used chemical treatments for mites. If you've used chemical treatment for mites in the brood area, you don't want them storm, storing honey in those frames that you're then going to, to extract. Would you ever just take the frame you found the queen on, on your semis above your honey super, and just gently coax with a bee brush so that she's down on a deep in the boot chamber? Rather than picking her up with your fingers, yeah. yeah. And if you've got gloves on, I mean, you're, you're not going to be gentle. 
So what you can do, what you can kind of do, okay, you find her on this frame here, uh, take the queen and scooter off, and kind of gently shake, air shake, not bouncing it on anything, air shake that down, and then quickly look again and see if she fell down in there. Does it have any consequences to the hive? Like, does the hive have to be born cells or emergency Any consequence to the hive? No. No, it's just your management system. So, so if she is above, um, um, and you still want to get some some honey, you've got to super, you got to go up higher still on that whole thing. And what this will become a wasteland sort of down there. They would never raise another queen down there. Well, uh, without the with the queen of scooter here, hopefully there's enough mingling. Uh, Glenn is asking, would they ever raise from brood down here another queen because their queen is trapped up above? And, and they could, they, they may, um, uh, you know, with a scooter versus a screen, the chances are they won't. Uh, but it depends on the population, so a lot of bad things can happen down below when she's trapped up above. Can you just take, let them clean and like, remove her food down below, put the queen scooter back on and just kind of let the bees clean up, just pretend like it didn't happen? Like, yes, okay, so then you have other frames of brood up here. You put her down, let that brood go, cycle through, go through its full cycle, and then as the brood hatches into adult bees, now that's a cell available for honey deposit. 